This is the European Union's migration policy. From arrival to housing and processing, admission and return, it's broken. The old system to deal with it in Europe no longer works. It's been labeled as not strict enough, not humane enough, and not fair enough. So why is it broken, and can it be fixed? This video was sponsored by Surfshark. To understand how the policy works, we have to go back to 1995. The EU was just two years old, Austria, Finland and Sweden just joined, and Yugoslavia was falling apart in a violent conflict. In that year, the Schengen area opened. It got rid of border checks between some EU countries and created free movement across the continent. But there was a catch. While it facilitated the movement of Europeans, it also made it easier for people coming from outside of the area to move around. To explain the problem that this created, we first have to talk about the different types of migration. Under Schengen, there are three types. The first is migration from people coming from member states of Schengen, which can move around freely. The second is for people coming from outside the EU, but having documents to stay, like a visa or a work or residency permit. Those two categories fall under what's called regular migration. And the third is irregular migration, for people who enter the EU without the documents to do so. It's sometimes called illegal migration. That last category is the one that poses a challenge. How to manage irregular migrants when they enter the EU. Under international law, these irregular migrants have certain rights. The Geneva Convention grants migrants who have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group the status of refugees. They're eligible to ask for protection or asylum in a country. But there's another category, economic migrants who come looking for jobs or opportunities. And importantly, they're not eligible for asylum. So if we go back to 1995, one of the main features of Schengen was that borders between countries lost their importance. This caused a problem. But first, we'd like to share a word about this video's sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN provider that allows you to reroute data through another server. If you're planning to connect to public Wi-Fi, or even on a private network like that of your university, using a VPN makes sense. Surfshark's clean web feature blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, allowing you to surf the web safely. And into Europe's case, we use it when navigating across dodgy Russian websites and looking for information on what's happening in the country. Another feature of Surfshark is that you can make it look like your IP address is coming from a different area or country. With Surfshark's more than 32,000 servers spread through 65 different countries, it means that you can change your virtual location to anywhere in the world. If you're on the go, this can make it possible to stream videos that are only available from a certain location. This means changing your Netflix library and getting access to videos bypassing geo restrictions. All you have to do is refresh your browser and it will show you to be in the new region and give you access to the video. With Surfshark, having a VPN has never been as convenient with the possibility to connect all your devices with a single account. If you want to support Into Europe and are considering getting a VPN, go to Surfshark Deals slash Into Europe and enter promo code Into Europe for 83% off and 3 months for free. Now back to the video. As Yugoslavia collapsed, it led to Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. And because of the EU's open internal borders, it led to a phenomenon called migration shopping. Instead of going to a single country and asking for protection there, migrants would visit several sometimes applying for asylum in several of them at the same time, and choose the best one to live in. To fix this problem, the EU set up rules for who would handle migration under the Common European Asylum System. The key element of this package was the Dublin Convention, which has been revamped twice and is now known as Dublin 3 for short. The key article of this piece of legislation is called Article 13. What it says is that irregular migrants, including both refugees and economic migrants, would be the responsibility of the country they first arrived in. Let's say a migrant arrived in the European Union through the Netherlands, wanting asylum. Under the Dublin system, he would have to be housed and have his asylum application there. Even if he wanted to go to another country, he would be sent back to the Netherlands. But in 2015, during the migration crisis, the system's flaws came to light. Thousands of refugees and migrants continue to cross into Slovenia. German police check lorries for smuggled migrants. Migrant camps in the south of Europe filled up. Caravans crossed the EU to reach wealthier Western and Northern Europe. In the case of Germany, which welcomed nearly a million migrants, they did so at Angela Merkel's invitation. While at the same time, Central European countries declared that they would not take any refugees. In that situation, Dublin 3 showcased that it had three main flaws. The first is about solidarity. 
the system ignores geography and the fact that nearly all migration comes from across the Mediterranean or from the east. That means that the countries at the south receive nearly all the migrants and under Article 13 are responsible for handling them. This has financial costs and political implications which those countries bear responsibility for. The second is that of returning migrants. Only about 4 out of every 10 people that applies for asylum in the EU gets their request granted. But out of those 6 that aren't, only one of them is returned to their country of origin. That's because returning migrants often means cooperating with their country of origin, something that's easier said than done. It means that even when migrants know they can't claim refugee status, they can still take the chance that they won't be deported. In 2020, while most migrants came from Syria, the next three countries were Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, which most EU countries consider as safe. These two aspects lead to a third problem. Since migrants are the responsibility of the first country they enter, and even when their application for asylum is rejected, they're likely to stay. It means countries have incentives to bend the rules to get rid of migrants. In the 2015 migrant crisis, this meant letting migrants due to the next country without registering them. And today, it still means sending back migrants without processing in what are called migrant pushbacks. To take some of the pressure off its migration system, the EU struck a series of deals with countries along the main migration routes, like Libya, Turkey, and Morocco to stop migration. And while those deals have been successful at holding back migration, they've come with their own set of problems. In Libya, it's been the cause of human right abuses, and they've been used by Morocco and Turkey to blackmail the EU. While all EU leaders recognize that the situation is unsustainable, they've been too divided to come up with a solution. On the question of migration, the EU can be roughly divided into three factions. The first is the pro-migration side. Despite the label, they're not for migration, but rather don't oppose it. They believe the EU has a moral obligation to help refugees fleeing war or persecution, and they also mention that migration could be an economic opportunity for Europe. There's also the anti-migration side. They mainly question the ability to integrate migrants who speak different languages and have different cultures. They highlight high profile events like the mass sexual assaults in Cologne or the terrorist attacks in France to show that migrants coming mainly from the Middle East or Africa are incompatible with European values. The debate between those two sides is complicated by their disagreement on who has the right to ask for protection in Europe. That's because the difference between an economic migrant and a refugee has been blurred. The anti-migration position states that most migrants come from countries that don't border the EU and that they could have applied for asylum in what are called safe countries along the way. They argue that refugees, when they come to Europe, are also economic migrants. And then there's the third faction, the border countries. They want support for dealing with the costs involved with migration, both financially but also in the housing and processing of migrants. So with those three sides, what does a working migration policy for Europe look like? One area of consensus has been the reinforcing of Frontex, the EU's border guard agency, which has seen its budget quadruple since 2015. Despite reports of abuses, the agency has seen its mandate to police Europe's borders reinforced. Another option for the European Union's migration policy can be found in the aborted 2020 Migration Pact, which pushed for mandatory solidarity. As it brings together all aspects of migration, border management and screening, asylum and integration, return and relations with external partners. It would have allowed countries to choose the way in which they contribute to Europe's migration efforts. Countries would have had the choice between either organizing returns or housing migrants. But since organizing returns is so difficult, opponents to the plan called for outside hotspots. Breakthrough would mean outside hotspots. So nobody can step on the ground of European Union without having a permission to do so because their request for asylum is accepted. This would create migrant processing centers outside of the EU. Advocates of the idea say that migrants should first apply for asylum before being led into the EU. While the move is legal under the Geneva Convention, NGOs have voiced concerns about potential abuses in migrant centers that are far away from Europe. But one EU country is pushing ahead with the idea. Denmark, which has an opt-out from the EU's migration policy, is looking to open such centers in Rwanda. In another development, Greece has unveiled closed-off migration centers to be able to process migrants more efficiently. And despite hints at successful integration of migrants in Germany since the 2015 migrant crisis, sentiment on migration in Europe is changing. And as stances on migration harden, Potential solutions like the ones being explored in Greece and Denmark are becoming more accepted. 
but what's clear is that as long as there isn't a working system for receiving, processing, admitting, and returning migrants for the whole of the European Union, migrants including those who have a right to asylum will continue to suffer. The issue will continue to divide EU politics and migration will continue to be used to threaten the European Union. Once again, a thank you to this video sponsor, Surfshark. Make sure to check the link in the description to get a discount on their VPN.